um, panelists. Uh, so we'll mostly have you pinned, uh, Tanya, for, for the audience, but we'll go from me to Anik to you. Have a wonderful event. We Thank look you very forward much. to it. Oh, question? Sorry, it's, this is a webinar, right? Is it a webinar or full? It's a webinar, yeah. It's a webinar. Do I and need we've... to mute and unmute myself or you mute and unmute? Like yeah, right now, you, I should mute can... myself. Sure, yeah, okay. go for it. And those of you who have just joined us and heard that behind the scenes chatter, lucky you, welcome in. Uh, it's always great to welcome folks in this way. Of course, we are also operational these days, so we do welcome you into Force Space proper. Let me just pull up some good afternoon notes as we get started. Officially, good afternoon, everyone, and on behalf of Force Space, Welcome. Nous aimerions commencer par reconnaître que l'Université Concordia est située en territoire autochtone, lequel n'a jamais été cédé. Nous reconnaissons la nation Kanyankahaga comme gardienne des terres et des eaux sur lesquelles nous nous réunissons aujourd'hui. Jaragay ou Montréal est historiquement connu comme un lieu de rassemblement pour nombreuses Premières Nations et aujourd'hui une population autochtone diversifiée ainsi que d'autres peuples y résident. Et c'est dans le respect des liens avec le passé, le présent et l'avenir que nous reconnaissons les relations continues entre les peuples autochtones et autres personnes de la commun communauté montréalaise. Concordia University's fourth space is activated daily via live events such as today's to create engagement around the various initiatives, dialogues, and projects happening across the university. It's therefore our pleasure to welcome you in person and virtually for this keynote presentation on the future of black storytelling by Canadian poet artist and Concordia alumna, Tahira Tanya Evanson. Thank you for joining us, Tanya. Before passing the floor to founding coordinator and manager of the Black Perspectives Office, Annick Mujid Flavien, I'll just remind you that we are in a webinar, so unfortunately we can't see you, but we will be able to hear you if you'd like to raise a virtual hand during the Q&A towards the end of Tanya's presentation. We can go ahead and unmute you. Otherwise, as always, the chat and the Q&A are activated for your reflections throughout Tanya's presentation. Also, we are streaming to YouTube, and I'll put that link in the chat now. Thanks, everyone, and over to you, Anik. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us. My name is Anik Mojil Flavien, and as Anna mentioned, I am the founding coordinator and manager of the Black Perspectives Office. Today, we have the absolute pleasure to have Tahira Tanya Evanson here with us to launch us in a series of conversations around Black storytelling and Black stories. Um, it has been really important for us um, in, at Concordia in our office to really think about what Black stories mean um, in the Canadian context, um, is particularly because there is a history of our stories either being misrepresented, um, erased, um, uh, undercut, undervalued in so many other um, versions of, anti of discrimination that have happened to our stories. And one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about in terms of Black stories is um, how do we do the call and response between Black storytellers and listeners? Um, and what is our responsibility as listeners as we move forward with these stories, um, as we engage with it, um, as members of the Black community um, who often come from some of these storytelling practices and how we can activate that for ourselves, learn about it more, um, try to embed it into our livelihood. Um, and as non-Black community members who are listening to these stories, hearing these stories and trying to see in way, the ways in which we can actually engage with them um, and the responsibility we have to propagate them and make sure, make sure that they're truly um, valued for what they are. Uh, as well as the unlearning that we need to do, right? So we've learned, we've been told many false stories of Black, about Black experiences and Black liveliness. Um, and so, so much of that is to unlearn and to actually create space for our storytellers to really tell the truth. Um, and it is such an absolute pleasure to have Tahira Tanya Evanson here with us, who is going to be talking a bit about um, the future of Black storytelling, particularly in the oral tradition of um, Black storytelling. Spoken word is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite forms of storytelling in our community. Um, and I think that thinking about poetry and spoken word and what um, that tradition has meant um, in the past, in the present, and will mean in the future is really, really key for us. 
So Tanya, I will just read her bio for you all, is a Canadian poet, author, multidisciplinary artist, producer, and arts educator. Her two poetry collections are both, Bothism and Nouveau Griot, and her first novel, novel, Books of Wings, was on the CBC Canada Reads 2022 long list, and one of Quill and Choir's 2021 Books of the Year. With the 25-year practice in spoken word, she performs internationally and has released four studio albums and six video poems, including the award-winning Almost Forgotten, Forgot My Bones. In 2013, she was a poet of honor at the Canadian Festival of so Spoken Word and received the Golden Beret Award and for her contributions to the genre. She is the program director for the Banff Center of Spoken Word Residency and vice president of the Quebec Writers Fe Federation. Born and based in Jokjagi, Montreal, of Afro, Antiguan, and Quebecois descent, she moonlights as a whirling deverish. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I pass the ball to you, Tanya. Thank you very much, Anik, for that introduction. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this talk on the Meta Griot, the future of Black storytelling in Canada. Um, I, uh, I'd like to give a shout out, first of all, to the Black Perspectives Office and at Concordia University for inviting me to participate um, during Black History Month, aka Black Futures Month. And all thanks also to all of you for zooming in. Um, I want to give a, also um, a land acknowledgement, a thanks for the lands and waters which uphold us here in Jojage, aka Montreal. Uh, this is unceded Indigenous uh, territory um, and the, whose caretakers are the Ganyangahaga Nation. And we hope that the work that we do here is um, received and accepted with the loving intention in which it is undertaken. So uh, when I first began to contemplate the future of Black storytelling in Canada, I was overwhelmed by the directions in which I could take the conversation in my mind because A, what is a story? B, how many ways can you tell a story? And C, who are the storytellers of tomorrow? Which Black Canadian artists are telling the stories that usher us all into the future? And what criteria do I use to define them? So first question, what is a story? An account of events, easy enough, until we contemplate the legacy of the story, the oral tradition. And the oral tradition is a badass. There is no other way of putting it. It is vast, multidisciplinary, speculative, and predates literature. So I'm going to share my screen with you. And as always, we hope this will work. Just uh... Yes, how does that, oops, we're going to start one more time. Okay. It was looking good, Tanya, we're just going back uh, in. full screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, something happens when I do that, and it should work now. Did it? It's just warming up. Give it a second. Okay. It's the storm. The it storm is. outside our window it here is. in Jojage is kind of uh, interrupting things, and we accept. We, it, it looks perfect, Tanya. Sounds good. Okay. So uh, as you can see, um, the oral tradition is a badass. <laughs> this is an oral tradition mind map to give you an idea of the vastness that I'm talking about. Now, this is a concrete poem exploring all the facets of the oral tradition with the understanding that it emerges from sound, song, speech, and story. Now, this is an incomplete map because there will always be something that the artist me in this case, because I created this mind map, there will always be something that the artist forgets. Or there will always be something new that has yet to be added or that has yet to manifest. Orality is a vast umbrella and it covers us all whether we open our mouths or not. Now, Black Canadians working in the oral tradition or working out of the oral tradition have this rich foundation, and it is only the beginning. We come to the second question. 
How many ways can you tell a story? Well, through literary arts, fiction, drama, poetry, prose, spoken word, through performing arts, dance, music, sound art, theater, circus, arts, oral storytelling, and visual arts, photography, filmmaking, ceramics, comics, drawing, painting, sculpture, installation, architecture, fashion, food, media arts, digital arts, inter no matter the form, for the storyteller of tomorrow, all platforms are in play. And then we come to the third question. Who are the storytellers, the black storytellers of tomorrow? And how do I define them? They are in the tradition of the griot. Now griot is a French word that refers to the West African keepers of oral history originating in the 13th century in the Mande empire of Mali. But of course, there is a much older history there as we know. Now griots are considered witnesses to the past, interpreters of the present and oracles of the future. They are revered orators who memorize important events in the village's history, births, deaths, marriages, battles. They embody the collective memory of the village by honoring those who've gone before, passing down acquired wisdom for the good of the community. A griot ensures that the community has the perspective of the past, as well as the news of the day upon which to base its decisions for the future. The griot can speak, sing, recite their stories, often to musical accompaniment, and entertain while drawing upon a history passed from generation to generation, from griot to griot. Now, this is the cover of Thomas A. Hale's 1998 book, uh, Griots and Griots, that I took out of my library. And here are some illustrations from inside. This is a sketch of a male griot from 1846, Senegal. And here is a sketch of a female griot, also from 1846, Senegal, by the same artist, Raphael. Now, Francis Bebe, um, who's an, um, a West African musician, writes about the griot in his 1975 book, African Music, of People's Art. The West African griot is a troubadour, the counterpart of the medieval European minstrel. The griot knows everything that is going on. He or she or they is a living archive of the people's traditions. The virtuoso talents of the griot command universal admiration. And this virtuosity is the culmination of long years of study and hard work, usually under the tuition of a teacher who is often a father or uncle or perhaps an auntie or a grandma. The profession is by no means a male prerogative. There are women griots whose talents as singers and musicians are equally remarkable. Now, a griot's job is at the intersection of many jobs. They are poets, historians, advisors, spokespersons, diplomats, peacemakers, praise singers, interpreters, translations, musicians, composers, teachers, warriors, witnesses, storytellers. A griot is also sometimes called a jali or a jelly in Mali. And as you see here, it says again, both men and women can be griots. In addition to all of these job titles, the griot is a diplomat, a mediator, a genealogist, an entertainer, an exhorter, a master of ceremonies or a ceremony participant. A single label doesn't work here. Now I define the black Canadian storytellers as being in the tradition of the griots. And how do I define those Storytellers of tomorrow, the meta griots. Now from the Greek meta, meaning beyond or after or self-reflective -ref or self-referencing, but not from ego. The meta griot is the black storyteller of the beyond. Think about well-known artists like Saul Williams, FKA Twigs, Erica Badu, Janelle Monet, Jordan Peele, Donald Glover. These are all meta griots. And in our case, we're looking at the meta griots in Canada. And this is the criteria that I've uh, used to define them. They are multidisciplinary storytellers. They have varied skills from the griots toolkit and they spin original tales. They are cross disciplinary collaborators. They work with artists across disciplines and the future requires all sorts of allies. 
They are experimenters with technology. They synthesize with new media. They use technology to their advantage, whether the work is live, audio, video, digital, or in the metaverse. And their futures are informed by the past. Black history informs Black culture. We move forward through knowledge of the past. And this is Sankofa. Now, Sankofa is a very interesting concept and a very important one. Uh, Sankofa as a word is, uh, is from the Twi language in Ghana. And it literally means to retrieve or to go back and get. Uh, to give you an example of this, I was in Ghana um, in 2018. No, 2019, and I have a tattoo on my arm that includes this symbol that you can see on the bottom, the, the heart-shaped symbol. And this exact symbol is in the tattoo that I have, and I was unaware for decades that I actually had this symbol inside the, um, uh, the illustration, the tattoo on my own arm. And it took another poet to see it on my shoulder in Ghana and tell me, that looks like you've got a Sankofa on your arm such as the level of erasure of black culture. Now this symbol uh, symbolizes taking from the past, but taking from the past what is good and bringing it into the future, bringing it into the present in order to make positive progress. There's a proverb associated with this. It is not wrong to go back for that which you have forgotten or that which has been taken or that which has been stolen. The concept is at the root of so much of the work being done by Black artists in Canada and all across the diaspora. Work that is informed by the past in order to build upon it, a decolonial practice that requires constant practice. Now, this concept is at the root of the Canadian storytellers of tomorrow. There are so many excellent Creos in this country on this land, all over the world. And this is just a small assembly. There have been others, there will be others. And please forgive any omissions that I have made here. This particular assembly of Canadian griots are artists that I consider to be seasoned and to be active, currently active griots, each with over 10 years of experience, except for perhaps one or two who are coming up hot. But these Black Canadian artists pen and perform original work and move the oral tradition forward and upward and outward into space. And I don't separate any of these artists from each other because they all exemplify the ingenuity and the genius of Black creativity. You know, I don't separate James Baldwin from Nikki Giovanni. I don't separate Kamau Brathwaite from Amiri Baraka. And I don't separate George Eliot Clark from Lillian Allen or Titi Lopez Onuga from Ian Kamau, or Shante Grant from Jamal Jackson Rogers. Please note though that missing from this assembly are the black Canadian griots working in French, because that's a whole other talk. <laughs> it's a whole other presentation. And that's just one other language. But I will mention Jean-Pierre Macosso, Joel Janis, Fabrice Coffey, Juju Turenne. These are specific artists working in this tradition and I just wanted to give them a shout out. From this assembly here of Canadian griots, I consider the meta griots who are thriving in 2022 to be these. Brandon, so this is clockwise from top. Uh, Brandon Wint, Ian Ketaku, I hope that I, I see that I am myself covering up some of these images, but I hope everyone can see them clearly. Brandon Wint, Ian Ketaku, Wendy Motion Brathwaite, and Kai Kello. Now, um, you know, there's a house of proverb. House uh, is from West Africa, a tribal group from West Africa. A proverb that says, when the music changes, so does the dance, and COVID-19 has certainly changed the dance. <laughs> now, the criteria that I use to define metagrios, multidisciplinarity, um, cross-disciplinary collaboration, synthesis with technology, and stories informed by the past, are such that these four artists were able to adapt and pivot quick during the pandemic, or in fact, predict. 
these artists, in fact, were already working with new platforms to share their stories with the world even before the pandemic hit and before it devastated live performing arts. Let us not forget what we have lost. We've lost events and series, ciphers, open mics, slams, uh, staples in Montreal like the Community Vibe Collective series, um, festivals, fringe festivals, the Canadian Festival of Spoken Word has disappeared. Organizations like Spokane, which support spoken word artists in Canada, have also disappeared. Live performance venues, small, medium, and large stages, which all offer professional sound and lighting and technicians to support the artists are gone. They're slowly coming back, but the majority are no longer around. We've lost the live audience energy. We've lost the ability to tour and to even sell books or albums um, you know, when we give live performances. And we've also lost training centers, places like the Banff Center and residencies worldwide. Now, though we have gained international hybrid virtual access to events worldwide, like this one, and I'm hoping that there's folks here who are not in Jojage, but who are zooming in from other places around the world. And that is something quite uh, unique and fantastic. You know, there is something to be said about Zoom intimacy that is very different from live intimacy. And I'll, we need to take a little bit of that um, uh, of that goodness as well. But for the GRIO, live performance is central. But for the meta GRIO, live performance is just part of the arts practice. And these artists exemplify this. So I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about Brandon Wint. We're going to start with Brandon. Brandon is a Vancouver-based, Ontario-born poet and spoken word artist who has performed across Canada and abroad. His poems and essays have been published in national anthologies, including The Great Black North, Contemporary African-Canadian Poetry, and Black Writers Matter. Divine Animal is his, first, is his debut book of poetry, and he has released spoken word and music albums and several short films. He is also an arts educator. Now, leading up to and during COVID, Brandon has been busy. Four of his projects has co have come to light in the space of the last two years, and three of those projects have come to light in the last three months. In October 2020, he put out his first poetry collection, Divine Animal, published by Wright Bloody North. And I mentioned the publishing house because they are great allies, and I will mention them again later on. In December 2021, he put out a 30-minute short film called My Body is a Poem, The World Makes With Me. In January 2022, he put out a video poem called Obsession. And February 18th, 2022, so, you know, yesterday or so, he released his third spoken word album, Freedom Journal, Antidotes to Violence. Now, these last three projects are in the last three months. This is a prolific metagrio. I almost want to say a mega prolific metagrio. <laughs> Multidisciplinary, collaborative, interfacing with musicians, videographers, motion designers, animators, publishers, and more to put forth his stories. Now we're going to get a small taste of his work through an excerpt from his short film, My Body is a Poem That the World Makes With Me. I'm going to stop share here and we're going to bring up a video. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit first about um, this uh, excerpt that we're going to watch. Now, the film uses poetry, memoir, illustrations, and family photos alongside motion capture visuals and music to explore the artist's relationship to his body, his disability, and his blackness, particularly in the present and historical contexts of life in the, in the Canadian prairies. Okay, and can you give me a thumbs up if, to make sure that we can hear this uh, as we play it? Um, and also, is this full screen? Does this appear to be full screen? Okay, lovely.
cigarette smoker's grey couch, still creaking in my bones. I am with two friends, and we are dragging our empty bellies toward an old school diner. I am dreaming of eggs and toast. I turn to one friend and ask the name of these blue-black birds I've seen all weekend, humbling sidewalks with their incessant, raspy cawing. Those are magpies. They're everywhere. It is June 2015, and the prairies are new to me. Still, I can feel the air changing, not just around my own body, which is unused to Alberta's dry winds, but around everyone. I have just ducked out of a conference of racialized artists and thinkers. There is an urgency building in the basement and seminar rooms of Edmonton's downtown library. All of the talk is about how black artists brown artists, racialized art activists might mobilize to create new spaces of possibility in this city. Places where we might find ourselves whole, creative, alive, and fierce. Beyond white supremacy's long, long shadow, its multitude of cloying hands, I find a bench that overlooks a segment of the North Saskatchewan River, and I feel the wind moving off the water. I have only just arrived here. Already, every room I enter is charged, rightly, with ideas for how this place must change. It is June 2015, and I already know this city will break me, revise me. Even in my fledgling conception of what this city is, I realize that Edmonton will revise me, only to the extent that I muster the courage to imagine how this place might be otherwise, how it has been otherwise long, long before my arrival. So that was My Body is a Poem, The World Wakes Makes With Me from 2021, Brandon Wint. And that was just an excerpt of a 30 minute uh, long series of video poems that all together make one film. Um, I will be uh, sharing links to all of these artists and this artwork in the chat today or a bit later on. Um, but is everything okay? Anik, you can hear me? Lovely. So this is a perfect example of the meta griot. Not only in this particular excerpt is the artist writing the story, narrating the story, acting in the story, directing in the story, but the artist is also questioning the story, questioning the arrival. And the story itself self-references the arts discipline in which it exists. Canadian Black storytelling, racialized storytelling in Canada. Now there's so much more I could say about the artists that I am highlighting today, but I'm going to, uh, I, we're going to have to move on because we only have uh, 45 minutes or so uh, to share all of this wonderful information, but now you have a taste of Brandon Wint, and we're going to go on to the next artist, which is Ian Ketiku. Now, Ian Ketiku is a Ghanaian Canadian writer and multimedia artist based in Toronto. Uh, he's strongly influenced by his upbringing and journeys throughout Africa. And in 2010, he was the World Poetry Slam champion. His debut book of poetry is Black Abacus, and it was published also by Right Bloody North. He also produces thought-provoking poetic films, and including Awakening Sankofa in 2018, and recently films for CBC, Sesame Street, and Team Canada. 
He also conducts creative writing workshops and teaches intro to spoken word, slam, and dub at OCAD U, or the Ontario College of Art and Design. Now, again, leading up to and during COVID, Ian Kedaku has been highly engaged. To begin with, he released three animated shorts, and we're going to get a taste of one of them today. Uh, in December 2020, he released Jolof Rice. In February 2021, he wrote and directed a film short for Sesame Street, which premiered on HBO. And in March 2021, he launched the trailer for Francesca Ekwuyasi's book, Butter, Honey, Pig, Bread. Now, during this time, during COVID, he was also teaching at OCAD. He was giving virtual spoken word performances and was recently a guest at the Canadian High Commission in Ghana giving a spoken word performance and speaking with the ambassador about human rights, the arts, and bilateral relations. This is such a wonderful example of a meta griot. Let's get a taste of his work with this two and two minute animated short that is an ode to Jolof Rice. Dinner's in an hour. I figure you know what this dude needs? A little more salt. A little turn. Lock, lock the mountains, mountains into glaciers? I'm totally screwed. I can't hide my mistake. Mom's a chef with her own TV. My jollof rice. Would I come you? Jollof rice is more than a dish. It's a symbol of pride and antiquity. Jollof originates from the Wolof Kingdom. However, the countries of Nigeria and Ghana have engaged in the proverbial battle of whose jollof is better, aptly known as jollof wars. Once, at a blind taste test, my Ghanaian brother chose the Nigerian jollof and has been banished from the community. It's all subjective. Let's say you're dating an African and they're brave enough to bring you home. His mom loves you. You have 16 degrees. Your family is Christian. Christian, rich, everything is good, including the jollof. With that being said, I have to represent for the legacy of Dr. Osajifo Kwame Nkrumah. Ghanaian jollof is the most supreme. If Ghanaian jollof was an athlete, it would be LeBron James. If Nigerian jollof was an athlete, it would be Tanya Harding. Ian. I was forced to write a hundred times, I will not put salt in my father's jollof rice. I will not put salt in my father's jollof rice. Got me feeling like the African Bart Simpson. I learned many lessons that day. One, cooking is not genetic. And two, the beef shouldn't be between Nigeria and Ghana. The beef should be in the stew for the delicious jollof rice. Right. Sometimes we still forget to unmute ourselves. How is it possible? Uh, that was Jalof Rice by Ian Kedeku. And um, so as as we now know, as we have been as the as we have been educated by Ian, Jalof Rice is most controversial African dish, and every West African has a unique relationship to it, to the meal. And now and we get here Ian's story. Um, now. I should mention that this is the first of three animated shorts that um, that Kedeku is, is creating to explore his West African heritage. And another example of the oral tradition in motion and sound and animation. And by the way, um, Ian also plays piano on this piece. And in, in, in Ian's own words, Jollof rice is a staple in Ghanaian households, and I wanted to explore the importance of the meal to West Africans through a story based on real events. Now, transcribing the poem to a digital space took editing, as some of the elements work best in person. And I think what he's trying to say here is that because we are used to presenting our stories in the oral tradition live, in front of live bodies, um, there is a big difference when you edit for other media. And this is what a lot of metagrios are having to do. 
Now, some of the now Ian continues some of the original jokes and references that are are common to African populations, but not a general public. And I thought about making the piece more accessible, and this meant adding context and history about Jolof. Now, this is a statement that highlights the importance of cultural links and storytelling for an audience that might um, be in Canada or might be elsewhere, might be in Ghana or elsewhere in the rest of the world. Now, this has the quality of Sankofa at its root, and its aesthetic is inclusive of all ages, and therefore, Black Canadian youth can see this and understand themselves and their history better, and this builds the future. The next artist that I'd like to uh, talk about is uh, Wendy Motion Brathwaite. Um, now, Motion is an in-demand screenwriter, playwright, poet, MC, and course director of Griots to MCs, Culture, Performance, and Spoken Word at York University. Motion is of Antiguan descent, and her work has been featured across Canada, the US, the Caribbean, Europe, and Africa. In addition to her two poetry collections, she has written and starred in plays, and her most recent is the 2018 stage production of Oral Torio, a theatrical mixtape, which was presented several times in Toronto, uh, including at the Obsidian Theatre. And I note this because we're going to also hear about Obsidian Theatre later on. Like Brandon Wint and Ian Ketaku, Motion has not only sustained a successful meta griot arts practice leading up to and during COVID, but Motion has increased her output. Since 2019, Motion has been a writer and executive story editor on the TV series Coroner, and her writing on the show was nominated for a 2022 Canadian Screen Award. She is co-writer of the feature film Achilles Escape, featuring Saul Williams, a name we heard earlier, another griot, another meta griot, and the film was nominated for eight Canadian Screen Awards and won five, including Best Original Screenplay by Motion. Now, Motion's recent uh, project in 2021 was Rebirth of the Afronauts, a Black Space Odyssey, which, was, which is a filmed monodrama. Now, this was for the uh, season two of 21 Black Futures, which was put on by Obsidian Theatre and CBC Arts. And we're going to watch a, a little uh, the trailer for that film in a moment. But ju this just in, Motion has announced on her website, which I checked yesterday, uh, that she will be the writer and supervising producer for the second season of CBC's The Porter, which recently premiered um, on CBC. So congratulations for that. This is, um, it's really wonderful. This artist gives me the shivers, I gotta say. Maybe also because I'm of Antiguan descent and it just is wonderful to know that uh, that Motion is, is doing all this work and, and having such success. Um, so let's get a feel for Motion's work by watching the trailer here for Rebirth of the Afronauts, a Black Space Odyssey, which, was, which came out in 2021. A quick descriptor for it. On the night before Reparations Day, a young woman gets a mysterious call. She soon finds herself on a surreal road trip that will change her life. So this is Rebirth of the Afronauts, a Black Space Odyssey. Okay, that was not that one. <laughs> Let's try that again. <laughs> and here we are. All right. Altitude, velocity, I T minus 15 seconds. They take frequent trips to the moon. Uh -huh. Bed, boots, backpack, wings. You are not going nowhere without your wings. Thank you. 
for y'all having a quiet New Year's Eve. Say goodbye to the last night of the 50s. New Year, New We. Crossing you over to Reparations Day. Gonna channel your cosmos with Georgia Ann Muldrow, some Ross G, then throw it way back to the last century. Earth, wind, and fire. Brides of Frankenstein. Star child, mothership connection. So no fear, my frozen ones. Your seer is here. Live from the astrolite. With the sounds that keep you lit. WSBACE broadcasting from You are not going anywhere without your wings. This is a, so this is a trailer for Rebirth of the Afronauts, a Black Space Odyssey. Uh, this was written by Wendy Motion Brathwaite. And this is a 10 minute film. It's a play told in verse. Now I did watch them, the whole film, and it is available to you. I'm going to be putting the links here in the chat in a moment. Uh, but I just want to mention that this, this play told in verse felt for me almost like a new epic of Sundiata, but with a female heroine at its center. And I thought that that was just uh, really brilliant. The film displays themes of Afrofuturism through its content, its music, its visual aesthetic, and it also incorporates ideas around reparations, space travel, destiny, language and technology, identity, and the African diaspora in North America. The film questions who we are as individuals, as people, as a culture and as a nation, whether first or second generation people of African descent, and what these ethnic and national origins mean within Turtle Island. So we're going to go now to the, the last individual artist that I'm going to highlight today, because I'm also going to highlight a couple of collectives later on. But the next artist I'd like to talk to you about is Kai Kello. Now Kai is a, um, a novelist, poet, sound performer um, from Western Canada. He lives in Georgiage, Montreal, and has roots in Guyana, South America. His books include Dominoes at the Crossroads, short fiction, Magnetic Equator, poetry, and Accordion, a novel. Now, Kai's writing has been awarded basically the highest prize you can receive in poetry, which is the Griffin Poetry Prize. And he's also received the QWF Hugh McClellan Prize for Fiction. So this artist is working in two literary genres only, and that's just in print. Now, Kai has been listed for the Scotiabank's Giller Prize, the Grand Prix du Livre de Montréal, the Amazon Walrus Foundation First Novel Award, the Relit Award, the QWFAM Klein Prize for Poetry, and I'm sure there's more to come. Kai's work has traveled internationally, and he continues to craft new passages. Kai's vocal performance uh, and recorded audio, uh, Kai has recorded two uh, spoken word albums with music, so Kai's vocal performance, recorded audio, and electronic narrative explore migration and the suspension of arrival. This is a very particular context from which to create work that moves us into the future. Did we really arrive here through the transatlantic slave trade? What does that arrival mean? Who arrived and who did not arrive? I think that that is at the core of a lot of Kai's work, and it's a very interesting notion, the suspension of arrival. Now, since 2011, um, Kai has created mixed media compositions with saxophonist and synthesist Jason Sharp. Now, leading up to and during COVID, Kai has upheld also a busy meta griot arts practice. Along with Motion, he was also commissioned to write a play for 21 Black Futures through Obsidian Theatre and CBC Arts. And again, we're seeing these allies that are all kind of um, moving among us and moving among the, the meta griots, and it's a beautiful thing to witness. The play that he wrote um, is called Ja in the Ever Expanding Song, and it was part of season one of 21 Black Futures. Now it's no longer available for viewing. So I'm gonna put the link, actually I should put all the links right now. <laughs> Please do check out season two and three of 21 Black Futures while you still can so that you can see at least Motion's film and all of the other wonderful artists there. 
And I will mention also that Kai collaborated with director and fellow griot, I will also call this, this human being a metagriot, Debbie Young. I'm just going to quickly put these in the chat. There we go. Now I'm going to continue on with Kai. In 2020, Kai gave several live and performance and um, in-person performances of text from his books alongside live music by Jason Sharp, really with whom he's had a long-standing relationship. And in 2021, he put out a 20-minute short film called Small Stones, which premiered at the Concordia University Spoken Web Symposium. Now we're going to check out um, the metogrioness of this artist by watching an excerpt of a live performance of the Fear Project. Now Fear is a seven piece jazz metal spoken word ensemble begun in 2019 by Jason Sharp and Kai and has had performances throughout 2020 and 2021 through Jazz Ahead Bremen in Germany, the National Arts Centre here in Ottawa, the Canada Council for the Arts and the Send and Receive Festival in Winnipeg. So we're going to watch now a short excerpt of the FEAR project. Flooding the future, betrayed by the notion of a future, redistributing each minute of the future, occupying the future, detaining the future, and the detaining the future at the border, drilling into the future, the future, or a future, fleeing the notion of itself, downsizing the future, precarious future, rehabilitating the future, an addicted to the Failing out the future, abdicating the future, recasting the future, insoluble future, tenant of the future, tuition for the future, future, future from the future to from the future from the future to from the past, robot future with no jobs left, post apocalyptic few in the few, no people of idyllic future traveling back, possible future, undo and oblique, future, a new be, a new be, a new beginning, future, a new be, and to rent the future, rent the future that belongs to no, 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 no one, recycle the future when you have. So that was um, an excerpt from FEAR, F-Y-E-A-R. And this is a project that was created by Jason Sharp and Kai Kello, also for an ensemble, which I'm also part of. And I was really happy to, um, to collaborate with these artists on this project. And Kai and I have collaborated in the past. Um, and it's always a wonderful, challenging, um, enriching experience for the artists and also for the audience. It's not always easy and art should not always be easy. Art can do so many things. So it's wonderful to see the strong collaborative practice that Kai has developed with so many artists. And there's a storytelling aesthetic here that is at once experimental, historically poignant, emotionally charged, and disturbing in various ways. And I'm very... Fear itself uh, is about 40 minutes or so, and it's a mixed media composition, as you can see, or as you saw, that bridges vocal, musical, visual improvisation with very specific composition. And there are juxtaposed elements of electronic, acoustic instrumentation, focused and abstract language and vocalization, heavy and disturbing noise or heavy metal sounds combined with expansive melodies that lead to a sense of freedom. 
So this is another <laughs> quintessential Metagrio project. Multidisciplinary, collab collaborative, techno-savvy, and one that interrogates the past and the present in order to imagine the future that we will inherit. Now, the future of Black Canadian storytelling lies not only with the individual Metagrios, but with the Metagrio collectives, right? Consider collectives like Afropunk, right, that operate online and worldwide, or the Chalewote Festival in Ghana, or the Nyege Nyege Festival in Uganda. Now, we have collectives here as well um, on Turtle Island, and I'm going to highlight a couple of them. So I'm going to share my screen again. And I'm going to, whoop, no, that didn't work again. One more time for the folks in the back. I think it worked now. Anik, we got to go here. Lovely. So these are the Canadian Grio collectives. Community Vibe Collective, Black Theater Workshop, Obsidian Theater, Northern Grio Network, Black on Black Films, Up from the Roots, COLA, NIA Center for the Arts, BSAM, Band Gallery and Cultural Center, Black Lives Matter, Nomadic Massive, the Fold Festival of Literary Diversity, forgive me for any omissions. But from this assembly, I want to highlight two of them, Obsidian Theater, which I've already mentioned, and BSAM Canada, the Black Speculative Arts Movement. Now, Obsidian Theatre was founded in 2000, and it's a leading culturally specific theatre company in Canada. They produce plays, develop playwrights, and train emerging theatre professionals. They are dedicated to the exploration, development, and production of the Black voice. Over the years, they've established partnerships, both locally and across the country, with organizations like the Stratford Festival, Harborfront Center, and most recently, as you can see here, CBC Arts. Now, their most recent success is 21 Black Futures. Now, this project is an anthology. Now, listen up. An anthology of 21 filmed monodramas by 21 Black Canadian playwrights, directed by 21 Black directors, and performed by 21 Black actors. Sometimes you just got to snap things out. Wow, <laughs> give thanks. And all of these um, images, you, all of these monodramas, most of them, you can see season two and season three on the website. Season one is already gone. Um, so I've mentioned today um, the work of Motion and Kai Kello in association with this project, but other griots and meta griots have contributed as well. Um, Donna Michelle St. Bernard, Luke Reese, Shante Grant, Lawrence Hill, Cyrus Marcus Ware, to name a few. Now, Obsidian Theatre has staged countless world premieres, and they are an award-winning organization rooted in the oral tradition of theatre. And now they've taken flight from that place into film and video through collaboration with CBC. Bravo. This project, I think, requires a lot more promotion and needs to be spread out um, throughout the world because it's, it's uh, quite a wonderful project. And it has essentially thrust many page-based Black writers into the Metagrio arena by having their plays performed and filmed in a professional studio. And all of these plays I will mention are under the theme of what is the future of Blackness. Now the final um, organization, the final Metagrio group that I'm going to highlight today is BSAM Canada, Black Speculative Arts Movement. Uh, they are an award-winning cultural organization based in Toronto. They are the Northern branch of a global movement they were founded as an artist collective in 2016 by Quentin Versetti, who is a self-proclaimed visual griot, and also by Kareen Weir. And since 2020, this is now a BSAM is now a nonprofit organization. They aim to broaden outlets of representation for artists of the Afro diaspora, including Black African, Afro Indigenous, and Afro Caribbean descended people. Now, I should mention the term speculative art, which is a very unique term 
it is a creative aesthetic that um, it's it's a creative aesthetic practice that integrates African diasporic metaphysics, science, and technology, aka Afrofuturism. Now, the movement seeks to interpret, engage, design, or alter reality for the reimagination of the past, the contested present, and as a catalyst for the future. Now, B Sam works in a variety of genres, from hosting conventions and spoken word and music performances to exhibits and films. Their current projects are impressive and show a way forward for Black storytelling in Canada because BSAM is a collective that both includes and hosts artists and groups of artists in the creation of new work that intentionally experiments with technology and new media. They, in fact, almost have too many current and upcoming projects for me to, to talk about. So I'm just going to say them very quickly. They've got six that they've done recently and more on deck. They have an ongoing Kemetic yoga series. And for anyone who's not familiar with Kemetic yoga, this is yoga that has roots in Egypt. And many of the postures actually are um, hieroglyphics. And so the postures come from the hieroglyphics on temple walls in Egypt, Kemetic yoga. So BSAM has an ongoing Kemetic Yoga series, and they've started that in March 2021. So I'm mainly talking about COVID projects here, or projects that have occurred during COVID. They uh, also helped to create a short film on emancipation called Among Us in 2021, a dance film and artist talk called Tessel, an animated short film called Rahim, and just, just a few days ago, February 16th, they launched an exhibit that's on display currently at Artworks Toronto North Hub called Imaginuity. Now this exhibit is going to run until May and it's very interesting because it's a multidisciplinary and interactive uh, exhibition that examines past objects created by Black Canadians and Afro-diasporic inventors and places them in dialogue with what they could possibly be a thousand years in the future. So this is a museum of 3022 or 3022. Okay, well, um, you know, the future of Black Canadian storytelling is bright, vigorous, dynamic. And in order for it to continue evolving, Black artists need allies and ally and for allyship to increase. Now, places for specific education and training are needed. Universities like OCAD, University of Toronto and Dalhousie offer courses by Black educators that explore the oral tradition and other universities should take note and follow suit. And I'll mention that the educators giving these courses are all griots themselves that I've list, listed here. Andrea Thompson is teaching, Britta B is teaching, Lillian Allen is teaching, Motion is teaching, Ian Ketaku is teaching, um, and Shante Grant also is teaching. And, and forgive me uh, if any one of you out there are teaching at the university level and sharing the oral tradition at the, at the university level. And if I haven't mentioned you, forgive me. Many universities like Concordia also have groups dedicated to the Black student body, the oral tradition, and the arts, and this should also be developed at universities across the country. And institutions that offer residencies, like the BAM Center, need to step up their post-COVID game and return to offering spoken word and Indigenous spoken word programs. Now, Black artists also need opportunities for cross-disciplinary collaboration, as well as access to new technology and access to artists working with new technology. Like, how can I stage an event in the metaverse? Where are the resources for me to figure out how to do this? Black artists also need funding. Canada is really lucky to, you know, we're only one of maybe four or five uh, countries in the world that have um, in, in a funding system for artists. Canada Council for the Arts, Heritage Canada, SOCAN, SODEC, it's, it's really wonderful that we have these bodies and we also have provincial and municipal funding bodies. But artists need more support and black artists in particular need even more support. Not only black artists also, indigenous, 
um, indigenous artists, people of color, LGBTQ artists with, uh, who are deaf or with disabilities need uh, support and access to funding through outreach programs and info sessions and unique programs. And the funding bodies themselves need to diversify and inclusify. I thought I'd made up that word, but I did find it online. So they need to inclusify their own board membership and management. And finally, Black artists need allies in publication, production, performance, and dissemination all year long, not just during Black Futures Month. We need more festivals, we need more conferences, we need more series and anthologies. We've seen the power here of Obsidian Theatre um, or BSAM working with CBC or artists working with National Arts Centre or HBO or how Right Bloody North, a, a publishing house, publishes predominantly spoken word artists and gives ample space to Black griots. They are a great ally. In conclusion, Storytelling in the context of Black Canadian artists is a shared language for revolution, a vision for a collective liberated future. We have the opportunity right now to decenter traditionally white arts institutions and whiteness as the standard. We have an opportunity to carve out space and create a Black Canadian contemporary art that actually reflects the society as we see it and questions people and questions government and predicts the future through its continuous rigorous revealing of the past. The future requires that the story, that the black storyteller of yesterday become the metagrio of tomorrow, multidisciplinary, in cross collaboration, experimenting with technology and in continuous study of the past where so much erasure exists and so much knowledge is simply in the wind. And so like the wind, I wish for us and for the genius of all black creativity, unlimited movement, unlimited joy, unlimited agency and unlimited liberation. Thank you very much everyone for listening today. It's been an honor to, um, to present these artists and this work to you. Thank you so, so, so much. Uh, snaps all around. Thank you so much, Tanya. This was absolutely beautiful. I cried. I laughed. I, you know, I had shivers. Um, it really brought me um, to so many places within my heart, within my soul, in my mind. Um, the, the comment section was, um, the chat box was popping. So you know that it's a good talk when the, when the chat box is popping. So thank you so, so, so much for that. Um, please sign me up for your school. When you open it, I'm there. <laughs> I will be your first pupil. Please sign us up. It is what an honor. Thank you so much for taking us through that. Um, one of the things that I appreciated so much of what you did is that you really centered the Black Canadian um, canon. I think that there is so much, um, we have been contributing to this country for so long. We are this country in so many ways, um, rooted and, and it's not just contributions, but it is a, um, an identity, right? That has been nurtured and, and fostered by so many and our storytellers are definitely on the front line of that work. Um, and to see, you know, your mind map really made me quite emotional, right? To just, to even visualize that, to, to see our, the names that are, are so um, key in our households, um, the names that I don't know that I'm excited to discover, um, and to really know that we have our, our, our thinkers, our makers, our storytellers, our griots, um, that, that there is really a very specific Black Canadian knowledge, right? And that, it's, that we can't, um, and it is not, Caribbean, it is not <laughs> African, it is not, it is really truly a Black Canadian knowledge. And, and I really appreciate um, that. I um, am so grateful for um, your deep dive and, and, um, and really also showing us the spectrum of possibility, which was so beautiful, right? With these four artists, I feel like you really allowed us to see um, the versatility, the, um, the language, the sound, the, um, the visuals that come with that. Um, 
as I said, please sign me up for your school. <laughs> it is truly wonderful. Um, I'm sure that there are questions that are going to come up soon in the question and um, answer um, chat uh, app at the bottom. So if you if you want to ask a question, you can use that button, but you can also raise your hand if you'd like to be unmuted and ask the question yourself. But to kind of get us started, I really wanted to talk about um, the collective memory and um, and how do we foster that in this? Uh, I was speaking to, to, to my supervisor actually, and we were talking about intersectionality and how in a lot of ways intersectionality feels like a bit of a misnomer because um, it almost seems like things only happen at the intersection, right? It's like, here is where it happens. And so, you know, I, I'm black and I'm woman. And so there's only, there's something that happens in that center, but that, but the reality of it is that it's, it's more, it's more like a stew. It's more like um, the, the, these lines are really inseparable, right? And, and how um, our identities are just uh, nurtured by the, the places we've been, um, our, our genetic lineages, our, um, the lands that we walk on and, and all of these things. And I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on um, how, how Canada has, in particular in this la these last two years, because we know that it's, it's been a time of pandemic, but it's also been a time of um, racial awakening. Um, it's been a time of um, uh, kind of social disturbance, which I think is really important for the world because it helps move the word for forward. And so how do you see that co the collective um, Canadian memory has shifted in the past um, two years in order for us to really um, see a, a deep integration um, and valuing and understanding of um, how Black Canadian stories are deeply part of that? Well, it's a, it's a really excellent question. The first thing when you said inter, in intersectionality and it's like a stew and I said, well, then we have to look at every ingredient in the stew. That's a, <laughs> We have to go and research every ingredient in the stew. But also, you know, it's not just COVID that has created this awakening, it's George Floyd. And, and that has created, and also this technology now that's in our hand. And so that we can actually show, look, this is happening and it's been happening for a lot like police brutality in the black community or against the black community, against basically the community of many marginalized communities has been going on for a long time. And now we have evidence. Um, and that has created, that has shifted the game. That has created an, an awakening that most of most folks in on Turtle Island did not know existed unless they were actually directly impacted or part of those communities. And that's a, a huge step. So now other folks are aware, oh, that was happening. That is a story that is part of history, not only your history, but my history, because we're walking these, this, these lands together. And I think that's a, a really important awakening. And that's why I said, we need to do things now. And, and that's because of, I don't want to say sacrifice, because a sacrifice is usually something you do willingly. And George Floyd did not give his life willingly, but it has become something of a symbol for, for folks who are not from the Black community, not from Indigenous communities, to see what the realities are. And I think that's, uh, that was a big spark. And, and we need to take that and keep showing it, because there's a something very interesting that um, I heard uh, not too long ago, you know, there is video evidence of the Jewish Holocaust, but there is no video evidence of the Black Holocaust, of the, the, the Holocaust of the transatlantic slave trade. There's no evidence. And so how can we know anything? How can we know what our ancestry is, what our ancestral language is? We don't. There's a very interesting book, and I'm glad I actually took it out. <laughs> um, uh, the Atlas of the Transatlantic Slave Trade by uh, David Eltis and David Richardson. Now, this is a book that was suggested to me by Saul Williams. <laughs> again, the, the names keep um, coming up again. And this gives evidence of the places where um, where uh, African people were stolen 
and transported and from which places they came and which places they went to. And it traces the information uh, through insurance companies because insurance companies, of course, human trafficking is a business. And so insurance companies have the evidence of what that business is about. And this book has a lot of evidence of that. And so I can actually look at the countries where, so for example, my father's from Antigua, I'm of Antiguan descent, and I can, it shows which countries, um, which boats came from which countries and went to Antigua. And you can see the specific ports that they came from. And so you can see the mix of African cultures that exist in Antigua because of because the insurance companies kept those logs and they are in this book, The Transatlantic Slave Trade, the Atlas of the Transatlantic Slave Trade. Now, I haven't ever seen any kind of information like this anywhere else in any other kind of book. So these kinds of things are continuously being uncovered and revealed and they're usually griot to griot, as we were saying before, right? Another griot tells another griot tells another griot and then we share it with all those around us. Um, because the more we know, the more beautifully we can move forward together. So that allyship, especially when it's across uh, cultures, um, when it's across, uh, you know, uh, cultural backgrounds, is more informed, is has a stronger base so that we can move forward together. You know, um, another example is all of the uh, residential school children that are being uncovered, all of those grave sites. This is not new information. So many indigenous people knew about this and talked about and tried to talk about it. And it's, it's not a surprise for many people in the indigenous community. It's just a surprise for those outside of those communities. Because again, erasure and a burial, not only of actual people, of the whole story of how that came about. So we need to keep digging. We need to keep doing that work. And there's, it's nonstop, this, uh, this work, this kind of Sankofa work to look into the past so we can move forward. I don't know if I've answered your, your question. I think I went a little bit off. There's too much but, to talk about. <laughs> no, this was uh, truly wonderful. And um, I'm gonna open the, the question answer uh, segment in a moment. I just wanted to follow up on that. So I've heard so much of, um, you know, one of the things that I think is is beautiful about your presentation is is really how, um, and even just the way that you speak about Black History Month as Black Futures Month, is that there's a moving away from um, the experience and into the story. And, and the way that I kind of make that distinction for myself is that, you know, if we think about um, Black experiences, right? So rupture, displacement, erasure, violence, pain, um, policing, pain, and so on. Um, the stories that we tell um, our next generations, that we tell ourselves, or et cetera, is not actually um, solely the experience, right? We, we've mentioned the experience, of course, because it informs um, what we're trying to pass on, but what we pass on is resilience, space-making, subversion, resistance, um, you know, uh, allyship, uh, joy, all of these things, right, that we've learned from these um, terrible traumatic experiences, but that um, we've built new skill sets in, in, in that. And, um, and so one, that's one of the things that I appreciate so much of our storytellers is that they do that work. And, and in your presentations, you, you really talked about how the past two years actually has allowed for some of our, you know, metagrios to become extremely prolific, right? And so much has come out um, during this time. And I'm wondering, as a culture, as a, as a country, as, you know, as a society, are we ready to receive these stories? Um, are we ready, like what, um, you know, sowing of the land do we do, need to do within ourselves to really be able to, um, to foster a, a nurturing relationship with these stories and actually allow them to enter ourselves um, and activate the action that needs to come from that, right? So in your mind map, that the call and response was there. And I think of that so much when I think about Black storytelling of how there is a call, but there's a responsibility to respond, right? You can't just take the story and be like, okay, let me go to bed. No, you're supposed to take this 
and have and be a changed person and change the world and so on. Um, and so if could you speak a little bit about what you feel is the responsibility of listeners, um, whether they be from the black community or non-black community, and particularly in a black in a Canadian context where we have not um, allowed for black Canadian stories to, to, to take the space that they, they need to. I think you bring up something really, really important. And that's that, yes, we are telling these stories and, and for black folks, these are stories of transformation. You know, we're going through all of the emotions and we are constantly going through those emotions. Um, and it starts with anger and sadness and sorrow. And we transform that by going deep into, into the story and, and taking what is good, which is again, the Sankofa notion. And I think for people who are not from the black community and who are receiving these stories, actually it's about, we need to bombard. <laughs> people need to be, and maybe this is not again, the, the best word, people need to, experience these stories more and more and more so that they it becomes normalized. And again, this is what I was mentioning at the end is to decenter whiteness as a standard so that there's, and, and that's about creating space. And sometimes creating space means that someone in a position of power and privilege might uh, have to choose to step aside. And and then, then we're talking about things like ego and security and survival and so that's why things like spiritual practices are very useful um, collectives that are intentionally um, either focused on the black community or uh, that are intentionally multi um, multicultural uh, intentionally multicultural those are really important too because then it, it opens the door everyone here is invited everyone is invited here to share and to listen and to receive to learn and to become a more beautiful human being. In the end, we want to all be beautiful human beings with each other. In my mind, this is the this is the goal. And to get to that beauty, we might have to dig through bones. In fact, which is what most people are doing. Not only Black folks, but Indigenous folks as well, and other marginalized groups as well. We are digging through the bones. So we just have to keep doing it until it's it, this is known information it's taught in schools it's part of the wider public discourse it's it's mainstream information that way we can move forward from there and that's going to take hundreds of years so we can't really ever stop whether we like it or not um, it doesn't ever end it's it's a practice that requires constant practice and that includes the listening Yes, 100%. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to add, um, look into the question and answer box right now. So there's a question from Nina. Um, how does one find and connect with other Black artists in virtual and physical spaces? Where would be a good entry point for a Black student artist to find community? Oh boy, what a beautiful question. I think I put some, I, I had a list of of Canadian griot collectives. So if you go back and watch this video on YouTube, you can hit that spot. Uh, it's near the second part of the talk and you'll see a list there of uh, griot collectives. And please forgive me if I've made emissions because I've only been working on this talk for the last few weeks. And the I had so much, I had to, I had to remove so much that I wanted to share. And that would be perhaps doing a really, um, a, a really, deep dive inventory of organizations, collectives, groups, associations that are out there um, that are fostering and nurturing Black arts. But definitely the two that I suggested, Obsidian Theater is one, and also BSAM, the Black Speculative Arts Movement. Those are just two. But there's also value in looking in your community, seeing what's happening in your city, in your town. And also what, um, if you, if there's an artist that you really admire, what are they up to? Go check out what they're up to. Which, uh, which uh, groups are they associated with or, or part of or, or leading? And could you go in through that way? So I think there's lots of opportunities, but again, we have to do our homework and we're always just Googling. <laughs> Definitely. I feel like it's going um, down the rabbit hole, right? So sometimes you, you start with one, you feel, you start with the one that you feel comfortable with for whatever reason. and 
you know, as you immerse yourself in that world, it'll it'll definitely open up um, to other worlds because like we saw in your mind map, right? They're, they're so connected. Um, I loved how you took the moment to really highlight, you know, these are same publishing houses. These are same collectives, right? And, and how these um, um, kind of behind the scenes of the artists um, also really build the network and, and support um, the, the continuation of the storytelling. Um, there's another uh, question. How does one use art to move through trauma tied to one's Black identity? My art feels separated from my Blackness, which is indicative of a certain disembodiment due to white supremacist society. How do I use my art to make um, my way back to my Blackness? I think that's a separate um, session that we can have one on one with the person that asked that question, please contact me. Uh, <laughs> I'm serious contact me. Uh, my, uh, you know what I'm going to put my website yes, in the chat please, and my yeah. email, or you yes. can contact me through social media. Uh, because these are huge questions and that they might be that you might require a, an answer that's particular to your arts practice that could be uh, helpful for you. And if I don't have the answer. Maybe I know someone who could give you the answers that you're looking for. But there's a lot of work to do. And I think it starts with the notion of Sankofa, as I mentioned before. And that's just one idea. I mean, we could talk about Ubuntu as a concept. With the, you know, it's it kind of um, never ends. These concepts that will somehow allow us to be confident and proud and knowledgeable and therefore able to uh, feel united with other human beings. And it does take a lot of work and it's work that's never ending. So please contact me directly. Maybe I can give you some specific resources and some specific ways to reveal yourself to yourself. Thank you for uh, making that available to this person. I, I really appreciate how much of a natural educator you are. I'm sure you've also, um, you know, nurtured that that practice for yourself so much as well. But, um, you know, to hear you speak the way that you engage with um, the audience, the way that you, the, the, the time that you took to present to us in the way that you did is, is really, really beautiful. So thank you for that. Um, we have a question from uh, Motion. Wonderful and powerful presentation, Tanya, with an exclamation mark. Uh, <laughs> wondering, do you feel in any ways through the centuries has Black storytelling, including futuristic elements or notion in the past, um, sorry, uh, has Black storytelling included futuristic elements or notions in the past, or is it more of a modern phenomena slash direction? That's a really wonderful question. And I think that both are true because as far back as your knowledge of your own history goes, that's as far into the future as I think your artwork can go. And it means that you've been doing a lot of work. If you are in, you know, it's not really spoken a lot of, but if you look at Dogon mythology, if you go into, um, there's someone, um, a shaman in South Africa, he's recently passed, his name is Credo Mutwa. You can check him out on YouTube and Credo Mutwa is a shaman and a storyteller who, and there's wonderful videos on YouTube about all of the history and, and history that goes back to star people. And I would say that not only is this a uh, reality in, um, uh, from the on the African continent, but it's also something that is very much a reality for indigenous people here on Turtle Island. Often you hear of this idea of we are the star people, we are from the stars. And so, and that's about, that's being aware of your history in a manner that can only have come through the oral tradition, because these things are rarely written in books. <laughs> so, and then even within Afrofuturism, there's differences, not only from perhaps what uh, people have explored before in, in, in work that happened before today, but work that's happening now. If you look at an, an, a writer like Nnedi Okorafor, um, let me write that one too. Uh, Nnedi Okorafor uh, is uh, an American writer and um, Nnedi says that her work is not Afrofuturism, it's African futurism uh, because she uses very specific mythologies and aspects from the continent and in her Nigerian heritage 
to bring forth stories. So even within Afrofuturism, there's all of these different paths that you can go, you know, African futurism or Afrofuturism or star people or looking at shamanism or having spiritual practices that connect you directly with these kinds of elements that are in the invisible world all around us. And there's great value in all of those things too. I mean, hitting a drum is important. I, I got a drum behind me. Uh, I always keep it there because it just reminds me of um, the sun. And I like uh, having the sun nearby, even when it's a, a snowstorm outside, it's nice to have that reminder or having artwork around us that is perhaps has, um, is from the African continent to remind us who we are and how far back these histories go. It never ends. It never ends. <laughs> um, I, I was talking to, I think it was with my mom, and we were just talking about how much, um, you know, we, we've been taught that time is linear, but it never has been. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that I, I feel when I, I engage with storytelling or, um, you know, it's, it's funny living in a house with an 80 year old and a four year old. And you're like, really? I mean, <laughs> the learning process, the way it's like, none of this is linear, just the life is life. Right. Um, yeah. It's been quite special. Um, we have another question, which I think is a follow-up from the first question. So you might um, want to do this offline, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, I'm also been obsessing over how I, how I can connect with my blackness via my art. How can I create a space with my art to foster blackness unidentified by whiteness or the white he hegemony? I feel, uh, I feel often I can't escape the critique of white people. I hear you. In the end, I don't think really it's about the other because the other is you, if we can get to that point. So the audience is you, the reader is you, the listener is you. You must feel um, that whatever work you're putting out is strong like a table. And then it doesn't matter what anyone says. They can sit on it. They can have a whole meal on it. <laughs> you don't even have to be in the room because what you've put out has its own strength. So that's, I think, also part of the, the artist's process is um, share, putting work out in the world and then letting it go. I mean, we, putting it out is, in fact, the final process of an arts practice. Um, you know, does the poem exist if it stays in, in my journal here at home? Does it really exist? Or is the reader the final part of the poem? And this is a notion that I just read recently by a, a UK poet named uh, Roger Robinson. I'm gonna put his name here too. And this is also, I would argue, also a meta griot working in spoken word and music, and also just received several, uh, I think uh, just received the T.S. Eliot prize for poetry in the UK. But this notion that the, the person receiving the work is the last part of the work and put yourself there. And if you feel satisfied, there's nothing else, regardless of any critique that comes, it doesn't matter. What you put out is exactly what it should be and it has its own strength and it doesn't matter what anyone does, it's strong like a table. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, we're coming to a close. Um, I have just one last question for you. Um, and it's really around how do we continue this practice, the practices, right? So we know that um, griots um, somewhere, uh, I know there's, there's legacies of you are chosen, right? It, you, it's your griot by birth. There's some that had schools of griots. There are some that it's genetic. Um, how do you see the education of these, the, the meadow griots to continue? How do you hope to, especially in a Canadian context, is it that you hope that schools will open up, that centers will open? Um, is it that you feel like this is a practice that's individual? What do you hope to see for um, our future meadow griots? I think it starts with the individual, but it has to move forward from there. And as I went through this talk, I started to see my own, um, not inadequacies, but areas that I need to work on uh, by highlighting the artists that I highlighted today, they are really wonderful examples. And I'm taking their examples. And one is, oh, I need to collaborate more uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm coming in the, from the spoken word tradition. I've done lots of collaborations there, but recently I'm moving more into print publication, which is, and writing is a very solitary practice. 
but the oral tradition is not about being solitary. So I think collaboration is really important. And, you know, I remember going to the to the library when I was little here in Jojaga in Montreal, my mom would take me to the library, my sister and I, every week for storytelling time. So it's nothing new. It just needs to return <laughs> and to increase rather than just disappear and only live um, through a digital sphere. It's expansive and vast. And so the oral tradition mind map that I presented at the beginning this is something that I created for a commission for a book that's going to come out either next year or the year after. And it's called, uh, the book is called um, Omniverse Lessons for Poets Who Perform. And so the, the oral tradition mind map will be there. And it's there as to show you what rich foundations that black artists have to move out from. And there's so much to choose from. So it's more about where do you see yourself in that mirror and go into that. And that's not all, it's only the beginning. You might look at the notion, as you mentioned, and make a call and response, but that's only one notion of the oral tradition. And so there's so much to do. It's what do you feel is your calling? What is your role? What is your contribution? What is your way of expressing yourself? And perhaps that way today might change in a few years down the line when you meet someone in the metaverse who says, what are you doing? Come and play with us in the metaverse. And then your arts practice grows and changes and you become also the meta griot. Thank you so, so, so much. This has been absolutely wonderful. Um, my heart is expanded. My mind is expanded. Um, just wonderful. I know that in the chat box, a lot of people have asked if the recording will be available. It is available. Um, this is live streaming on YouTube right now. And I believe you put the, the link in, but maybe we need to put it up again a second time. Um, thank you, Tanya, so much for being here with us. It has been an absolute pleasure. And thank you for um, being our keynote, but also really, um, uh, you know, moving us forward in this continued conversation around Black storytelling at Concordia. It is such an honor to have you here as an alum as well, um, you know, Concordia rep. <laughs> so thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Anik, and um, uh, for the Black Perspectives Office for inviting me and for Fourth Space for hosting. And it's really nice to kind of come back to the university that I studied creative writing and English lit at and to kind of come back and as almost a, a new version of what I was when I left many, many moons ago. And thanks also to the audience for, for joining us and for asking all these wonderful questions. Uh, please feel free to contact me if you have more. I'm always available. Tanya, your generosity knows no bounds. Uh, you, <laughs> you are really uh, an amazing presence here in Force Space, as always. And we were just reflecting how a couple of years ago we almost kind of went away into our little boxes uh, right on the heels of uh, Tanya being in Force Space and doing a great performance and a talk and so on. And, and here we are again, this time virtually, but we welcome you back anytime. I know you have some projects brewing and I know we'll see you in here again, but Anik, uh, also thank you for bringing uh, Tanya in and um, for facilitating this conversation. As always, you do a wonderful um, job kind of entering conversation with your guests and tending to the audience. So congrats on being a super moderator. Um, <laughs> we're really energized and excited on this beautiful Friday afternoon. Uh, and that's thanks to you. So a big shout out to everybody who's who is here. Tanya, I hope you have a moment to reflect on all that chat. We could send you the chat history so that you can kind of read all the nice comments that people sent in. And again, thanks for your time and energy. On that note, there's always a note, and this is the one <laughs> where we say goodbye and until next time. Have a great break, everybody, those of you at Concordia who are going on break, and we'll see you in March. All right, cheers. Bye.